If you're an artist or someone that works with any kind of creative medium, you most likely have social media. Whether that be Instagram, TikTok, or something else, these platforms are the most accessible way to share your work with the millions of people on the internet. It's almost a given that if you create anything, you have an account. And this makes sense because having an online presence opens the door to so many opportunities like connecting with other creatives, collaborating with businesses, or building your own brand. But depending on your goals, navigating these platforms and the act of posting becomes increasingly challenging and complex every year. And honestly, it can be exhausting. The topic of this video has been on my mind for a while, which is the problem with social media for creatives. I've seen a few videos addressing this topic, covering aspects from content creation to algorithm shifts, but I feel like the real issue is a layered one. And as social media continues to evolve, it's becoming clear which direction it's heading. I want to mention that this may not apply to all creatives as there's many people that enjoy social media as is. But if you are a creative feeling disillusioned, I'm going to unpack these layers to get to the real problem and what you can do about it. While I specifically refer to Instagram, which is the most popular for creatives at the moment, the general sentiment will apply to all major platforms. First, I want to preface by saying this video isn't condemning social media. In theory, it isn't a bad thing and does exactly what it says, which is to socialize and connect people digitally. But in 2024, if that's all you were looking to do, the process has become more involved. That's largely due to how users engage and interact with social media, but also the expectations set by the companies that own the platforms, which are focused on retention and growth. Because of what social media has become now, creatives end up having to look at it through the lens of a content creator, regardless of their intentions and whether they wanted to in the first place. Depending on how you view it and what role it plays in your life, this often means prioritizing engagement metrics, likes, comments, and shares. Making this the focus can lead to many other problems that can be pretty damaging to creatives, especially if all you wanted was community and connection. Starting with the first layer, let's say you created something and you want to share it. So you post whatever you made as is to a platform, and it can either perform really well or not at all where it seemingly goes unnoticed. Regardless of the outcome, it can affect your mental well-being. And this is already widely understood about social media. Because it's essentially a digital representation of you, it's easy to associate those visible likes with your worth, despite it being superficial and inaccurate. So the more engagement, the more validation you might feel. And conversely, the lack thereof can be discouraging, especially in comparison to other creatives thriving on the platform. This can also lead to doubts about the quality of your work. And while there's always room for improvement in whatever you create, it's important to consider the role of the algorithm which determines your visibility. Therefore, this means appealing to it or presenting your work in a way that's optimized for social media. Now we come to the second layer, which involves creating for the algorithm. So it recommends your content to a relevant audience. And there's no shortage of best practices that range from making additional material to posting times to fixing the post description. And while core ideas like quality, storytelling, and knowing your audience stay the same, many can change with almost every update. So things like making a reel, a carousel, making sure it's this long but this short, using hashtags, not using hashtags, the list goes on. And no matter how much effort you put in, there's no guarantee it'll actually pay off. Sometimes it works and other times it doesn't. And while you can learn from your own analytics, it's not easy to pinpoint exactly what the deciding factors are. Regardless, you end up being influenced by the algorithm in some way. And depending on how much appeal your content naturally has, this can feel like work. You spent all this time creating something, but now you have to create this other thing in order for it to be seen. There is an art to showing the art, and if this isn't your strength, it quickly becomes draining. 
And now the third layer, if you want continuous visibility and to grow, you end up having to think like a content creator, even if you may not want to be one. The term content creator is broad and kind of problematic because it refers to anyone or anything who posts on social media continuously. There are many ways to approach creating content, so it's relative to each person. Unfortunately, we all get lumped into the same basket regardless of quality or amount of resources. So this fosters a sort of competition among those who can optimize their content for the algorithm best. And if you're a sole creator or a team, it doesn't matter. Undeniably, the pressure has pushed some creatives to adapt by picking up writing and editing skills and becoming strong advocates for their own work. But the extent to which those skills are actually beneficial can be subjective. While some creatives have learned to brand themselves and effectively communicate the value of their work, others repeat the same tried and true format because it gives them the most reach. I'm not saying any one of these approaches is better than the other. Again, it all depends on what your goals are with social media. But as a creative, being a content creator and optimizing your posts for performance inevitably becomes part of your creation process. And this shifts the focus from creating for yourself to creating content for the algorithm. The fourth layer is where we start to scratch the surface of the problem. Based on the last point, it might sound like I'm against any form of post or search optimization, which I'm not. It makes sense given the volume of users on these platforms. But it becomes a problem if the algorithm significantly influences the creation process. And this is where I feel creativity becomes compromised. You could argue that working within what's desirable by the algorithm is creative in and of itself. So this might include making a process video, some other supporting material, or changing the actual work. But if none of this was intended to be part of your process in the first place, are you really fulfilling your original creative vision? Could you have put that effort into something else that contributed more to your creative endeavors or development? Regardless, having to factor this in and create anything additional takes time, and time away from what you might actually want to be doing. And given how often it's recommended to post, it's more efficient to use and recycle ideas that have already been proven successful by the platform. Things like trending music, templates, editing styles, transitions, filters. The algorithm is designed to surface engaging content, so it favors those that conform to these patterns. For creators, it maximizes reach, and for the platform, it keeps users engaged longer. As a result, you end up seeing similar kinds of content. Again, you might say, this isn't necessarily a bad thing since it sets a standard and encourages creativity and innovation to stand out. But stand out why? Well, for the platform, and that's what it always comes back to. What was initially a fun place to casually share your work becomes a competitive environment focused on what the platform wants to see. And making that your focus for creating can be stifling to your genuine creativity. Let's say you discovered your own format that goes viral. You finally found a balance between your creativity and the algorithm, and it feels like you figured something out. So you decide to repeat it for engagement. Honestly, I'm totally guilty of this myself. You gain lots of followers, but after some time, you decide to change it up. As I mentioned earlier, it's hard to pinpoint the exact factors that make a post successful. So by pivoting even slightly, you risk losing those followers you gained. And from personal experience, that generally tends to happen. To keep growing, you might feel pressured to stick to your original format, despite it pigeonholing you and attracting a fickle audience. After a while, creating in this way can become unsustainable and lead to burnout. So if you're not creating what you want or building the community you desire, why stick with it? There are many reasons to stick with it, like growing a following and maintaining digital relevance. However, I'd argue that the most common ones are often related to entrepreneurship, building a business, sponsorships, sales opportunities, affiliate links, etc. Depending on the size of your audience, this can be lucrative. Even if these motivations don't resonate with you, they do for many users. And given that they're so heavily integrated into the social media ecosystem, bringing monetary value to it, the platform encourages them. 
As a result, social media is competitive not only from an algorithm standpoint, but also among users with sales-driven motivations. With that in mind, you might feel the need to adjust or reevaluate your creation process entirely. This raises the question, are these platforms conducive to fostering your genuine creativity, or are they just a hindrance? There are people who are strictly creatives and those who are strictly marketers. Some can be both, but not everyone is. So you have this divide among creators driven by the creative, creators driven by the metrics, and everyone in between. But because metrics are measurable and yield more predictable results, understanding of the algorithm usually focuses on those factors. Then it's distilled into best practices combined with some general creative guidelines, and then communicated to the masses by social media gurus and specialists. While some creators produce truly original work, others prioritize incorporating these best practices like popular formats and rapid editing styles. But then there are those who only focus on the bare minimum to satisfy the algorithm, exploit it, and end up with a low quality result. And some just resort to copying explicit visuals, clickbait, abusing AI-generated tools, and numerous similar tactics. And still, we're all categorized as content creators. But despite our differences, we're on social media under the idea that we can build something for ourselves. So to be viable on social media requires a change in mindset, to start thinking like a business. And that means being serious and strategic with your content creation process, almost as if you're trying to sell something, whether that be information, an idea, a company's product, or your own. And the platform supports that line of thinking with various business features. But I'd like to highlight probably their most creator-focused monetization feature, performance bonuses. Bonuses are Instagram's way of appreciating the engaging content you create and share. With bonuses, every reel and photo you share could be a step to earning rewards. At first glance, this seems like a great program because it finally feels like Instagram is giving back for all your time and effort, and it really seems like they're advocating for creators. However, for the platform to directly attach a financial incentive to what's free transforms it into something else entirely. Not only does it make it more competitive, it also shifts it from a socially focused environment to a more commercialized one. Obviously, commercial opportunities are not new to social media, and again, they're probably the main reasons why some people are on it. Things like sponsored posts, affiliate marketing, advertising, shopping, and selling, these are what make being an influencer and starting a small business feasible on social media. The platform being the bridge to these opportunities, but not necessarily the direct revenue source. So for them to offer performance bonuses clearly communicates a significant change in their vision for the platform. Now, you might argue, well, YouTube's been incentivizing creators to monetize their content for years. It only makes sense that Instagram follow along. Sure, but there are three key differences. And in this comparison, I'm only going to talk about their primary content monetization methods at the moment and excluding YouTube Shorts. The first is the nature of the platforms. YouTube is primarily long form, which often requires a deliberate decision to click through based on a title and thumbnail. And because it's a time investment, this typically means the content is something you have a specific interest in or have actively searched for. Instagram, on the other hand, is short form. It emphasizes immediate and easily consumable material. And the decision to engage is more passive, driven by what's eye-catching while scrolling. So if it isn't within the first few seconds, you'll just scroll to the next one. Both platforms provide a personalized experience, but in different ways. YouTube promotes content based on user preferences to keep you engaged, valuing watch time. Instagram promotes content that's visually appealing to keep you interacting more frequently, valuing likes, comments, and shares. And while both aim to keep users on the platform, it boils down to how long versus how many. The second is how monetization is set up. On YouTube, creators earn through ad revenue sharing, where advertisers pay YouTube to display ads on their videos, and a portion of that revenue is directly shared with creators. This model provides some financial independence from the platform. In contrast, Instagram's funding for performance bonuses comes directly from Meta, and they determine the amount of revenue based on performance. This difference highlights a greater reliance on the platform for earnings. Therefore, even if you're already optimizing your content for a specific platform, 
Creators on Instagram are particularly incentivized to cater to it in order to meet the criteria to earn. Now, I'm well aware that YouTube offered a fund for shorts a few years ago, and I think I even participated in it. And this was while they were solidifying a monetization model, but they've since switched to an ad revenue sharing one. And conversely, I know that Instagram is looking to implement something like ad revenue sharing this year and is still being tested. But it's different from YouTube's model in that it's still performance based and not tied directly to ad revenue, which leads to the third point, how payouts are determined. On YouTube, payout amounts are primarily determined by watch time, with longer videos leading to more ads being shown and higher revenue. YouTube encourages longer viewing sessions, allowing creators to experiment with whatever drives watch time. Instagram, however, bases payouts on the number of views, likes, comments, shares, and saves. And although some of these are also important to YouTube, Instagram focuses on them because they measure immediate engagement, which makes sense given their content form. This often encourages creators to adopt highly visual and attention-grabbing tactics. Now, you might argue that YouTubers use similar tactics with clickbait titles and thumbnails, but the difference is that these aren't built into the actual content. They serve more of a marketing tool and gateway, allowing the content to be standalone. So on YouTube, because the attention grabbing factor is separate from the content itself, you're given more creative flexibility in how you hold your viewers' attention, which aligns with YouTube's monetization structure. In contrast, on Instagram, the content is the thumbnail while you're scrolling, requiring you to incorporate attention grabbing elements into the first second. This automatically limits you to specific formats that align with the platform's ecosystem to garner quick numbers. Instagram further reinforces this with its monetization strategy, as your earnings depend on how well your content performs according to engagement metrics. I'm not saying YouTube is the perfect platform. However, if you are serious about content creation, the process and approach on YouTube work more in your favor, whereas on Instagram, they work more in favor of the platform. Now, any content creator will tell you that neither of these content monetization programs are enough to solely rely on for a sustainable career. You'll need to find opportunities outside both platforms. However, the important takeaway is that Instagram's strategy is a strong indicator of its vision and goals, and it's becoming increasingly clear that these don't necessarily align with some of its creators. When Instagram first launched in 2010, its mission was simple. Fast, beautiful photo sharing for your iPhone. But in 2024, it's now under the greater meta mission of bringing you closer to the people and things you love. It's become a lot more comprehensive, including support for all forms of media and adding messaging features, shopping, and community building tools. And like any business, it has pressures to grow, sustain, and expand. Although they've innovated in their own right, a lot of it has been reactive. For example, removing caption requirements to capture bloggers, then adding stories to compete with Snapchat in 2016, IDTV to compete with YouTube in 2018, and Reels to compete with TikTok in 2020. Now Threads to compete with Twitter X in 2023. Obviously, that's a different platform, but its viewing experience is pretty integrated. It clearly wants to be the go-to platform for every user, and that means keeping people on their platform and away from competitors. From a creator standpoint, it seems like the perfect place for all your needs because everything and everyone is there. And for Meta, it allows them to generate more revenue because they can show more ads and attract businesses to spend more on advertising. So it's evolved from this basic social media sharing app to a robust media platform that heavily supports commercialization. Although it still presents itself as a community-focused platform, its goals and actions haven't been all that favorable to the creators on it. Instagram knows their platform relies on creators, and they know how much of a significant role they've played in their careers, some becoming entrepreneurs, brands, public figures through the platform. And when you examine some of those creators' journeys, it looks like Instagram has implemented features to support them at every step, positioning itself kind of like a business partner. 
That understanding seems to have given Instagram the leverage to take on this agent role with the ability to exploit by controlling reach. This means they can influence creators to produce content that aligns with Meta's objectives. And while the platform allows you to build something, there's a persistent feeling that it can be taken away at any time. And Instagram constantly reminds you they have control over your journey, depending on how well or poorly a post performs. And if a post doesn't achieve the desired reach, you can always boost it, which requires payment. This creates a scenario where creators that are pursuing this path might feel compelled to pay for growth. While that benefits larger creators or those with more resources, it creates an uneven playing field, and smaller creators are particularly at a disadvantage since they may not have the means to boost and rely on organic reach. Furthermore, if things don't work out in your favor, the blame often falls on this nebulous entity called the algorithm. Now, everyone likes to point their finger at the algorithm, even the social platforms themselves. So if a post doesn't do well, other creators may say, well, it wasn't optimal optimized for the algorithm, and the platforms will have a similar argument. It's essentially the scapegoat for everything, and while I get that perhaps a post you made isn't visually appealing or just good enough, defaulting to it's the algorithm still reinforces the power the platform has. So to a content creator with a marketing mindset, they might see this as an opportunity to create a better hook, change the structure, or use better music. But to the creative who just likes to make art, they might believe their art is just bad, which is not necessarily true. It just might not lend itself to the sales aesthetic the algorithm prefers. It's not loud, trendy, eccentric, or shocking. The emphasis on the algorithm has allowed its preference to become the baseline for quality and what's desirable. And while that works for the platform to consistently get better and more refined content, it's something that was constructed within the Instagram ecosystem. My point being that it shouldn't be a general determinant of what's objectively good. It is for the platform, but not for everything that everyone creates. And to be honest, the algorithm is just something the platforms can hide behind to further their priorities and justify changes. All they need to do is shift all the liability onto this supposedly independent factor, but it's still on their team and they can influence it. They just did so recently in saying they wanted to highlight smaller creators, which sure, in theory, that's a great thing, but communicates another potential imbalance on your platform, specifically for those that already have established followings. Obviously, there's an algorithm behind everything we interact with, but as we've discussed, Instagram's is much more focused on aggressively achieving its goals, including shaping the creative aspects of content creation. I'm not really sure where Instagram's trying to go, but I can kind of paint a picture. It feels like they're moving away from a social media network to just becoming a media network, focused on entertainment, perhaps something short form related. Everything they're doing now could be a strategy to put forward creators that could justify a subscription or premium. They're already testing ad-free viewing in the EU for $14, although you'll still see sponsored posts. But honestly, so much of the user-generated content on the platform are ads already. And obviously, Meta's business is data, but if you don't pay for this model, I like how they explicitly say you consent to them using your info for ads. I feel like because there's so many users, there's an equal number of cracks they can navigate through to keep using your data anyway. So it doesn't surprise me that they could be using it to train their own AI generative models, which they supposedly give you the option to opt out of. But if we're being honest, I feel like it's just a UX feature designed to make people feel comfortable when it probably doesn't do anything. If Meta didn't respect your data the first time and made a lot of money, they're most likely not going to a second time, especially if they want to stay competitive. And if you understand anything about AI, once a model is trained, there's not much you can do about it. And recreating a model from ground up with ethically sourced data would be a Herculean effort. And retroactively removing selective data from a huge data set is also difficult. Therefore, when companies say you can opt out, the process isn't as straightforward. Sure, there are offensive tools like Nightshade AI, but there's limitations and ways to get around it. And it might improve the models through unsupervised learning in the long run. So for anyone posting, I don't give Meta permission to take my stuff, 
I don't mean to be dour, but they probably already have. In that case, maybe they're trying to be a next generation ad platform that removes the need for content creators completely. And although that sounds a little dystopian, it doesn't seem unlikely. With the new meta AI implementation, it's difficult to search outside of this feature, so there's more reliance on it. And they seem to be shifting away from social interaction and more towards content consumption. So meta is probably like, imagine a platform where you get to see what you want to see because we can generate everything. Well, what we want you to see so you can spend more money, but again, with the help of your data that's relevant to you. It's a win-win for both parties. Meta could stop the onslaught of creators complaining on Instagram while also providing higher quality, targeted content to the user. I mean, you already have AI-generated influencers and content flooding feeds, so I don't think this is completely out of the picture, who knows? Speculation aside, while Instagram claims to support creators, there's a clear disconnect between its stated mission and the reality. And now we arrive at the last layer. So if you're a creative that kind of got lost while I was talking about all that content creation stuff, no worries because that's exactly how complicated it's become. It's not hard to make the comparison between Instagram and a commission-based business model, except you aren't selling an Instagram product. You are the product. You create content that drives engagement and revenue for the platform, and the performance of your post determines your reward. And Instagram doesn't need to invest in you, and there's no risk for them since creators absorb it all. And if you end up leaving the platform, there's millions of others anyway. So on Instagram, the term content creator makes sense. You create content on the platform for the platform, not for yourself, but effectively for someone else. And for those saying it's all voluntary, nobody's making you do it. Well, that applies to everything. It's all voluntary until you decide to do it. For many on social media, the reason they create on the platform in the first place is the possibility of building something or carving a unique space in the vast digital landscape. And unfortunately, Instagram exploits this motivation as a selling point for the platform. There are some people on the platform that don't mind creating sales-driven content for companies and businesses, but for others that just want to show their creative work or build their own creative community, this puts them in a tough position. Social platforms are still the best way to reach many people, but the way they operate end up something you unfortunately have to contend with. So as a creative, if you don't want to be a content creator and Instagram and social media takes up your time, potentially your money and creativity away from the process, is it right for you? So I've been posting things I've created online for over 20 years. And this started back when I first got into graphic design. In 2002, my dad gave me a copy of Photoshop and I ended up teaching myself. And it was so much fun. I loved being able to create things in the program because I hadn't used anything like it at the time. I think the closest programs were Paint and Microsoft Word. It was cool to use blending modes and combine layers together. And I was really into video games, so a lot of my work involved incorporating my favorite characters. But all of this changed for me once I started using Zanga. Zynga was a social blogging platform that came out around 1999, and I think this was around the same time blogging as a business started becoming popular. So you had websites like Blogger, LiveJournal, and I think WordPress came out shortly after that. But as a kid in junior high going into high school, Zynga was the social platform to be on. Everyone had a name screen name, AOL Instant Messenger, and then in your bio, it would link to your Zynga blog. Now, the cool thing about Zango was that you could add friends and journal your thoughts and people could read it. But what made me love the platform was how much you could customize it. So there was a look and feel section where you could use HTML and CSS to create unique layouts and completely revamp your blog. This opened my eyes to what I could do with graphic design and I became obsessed with making layouts. So many layouts around video games, my favorite characters, Spider-Man, Japanese horror movies, J-pop and K-pop, a lot of K-pop like Boa. I was a huge fan, still am, uh, whatever I was interested in. It was so much fun to combine it with graphic design and then make a layout to represent my interests. And a layout to me wasn't just a visual, it was creating a world for someone to step into and experience. 
I even started making layouts on this website called bloggering.net, which was a hub for all of these layouts. I made a lot that the only time I ever got recognized in public was in high school. At the time, I was a sophomore walking between classes and this other classman came up to me and was like, are you so and so and so? My username was kind of embarrassing and I was like, yeah. And he was like, that's so cool. It's so awesome to meet you. I love your layouts. I'm using one right now. And I was like, great. And then he left. And then my friends were like, do you know him? And I was like, no, he just found me on Zanga. So that was really exciting. And I also met more friends online that were also interested in graphic design, learning through creating layouts. So we had a little community that helped each other. And I actually got to meet some in person. But the cool thing was that we were able to foster this common interest together and we all grew into creative careers, working at big companies like Google, Hulu, Squarespace, and Disney. Looking back, those years were super formative for me. They were essential to my creative development, helping me harness a strong identity in my work and sense of self. I didn't have the pressures of an algorithm or being made fun of, and honestly, some of that stuff is cool now, but back then, my interests were completely unpopular. I didn't have to care about engagement or compete for visibility. I wasn't pressured by trends or motivated by something because it was popular. I could create whatever I wanted, be my nerdy original self and focus on getting better. All while having people and creative peers I cared about take the time to interact with me. Obviously, it's different for everyone, but personally, if I look at the landscape now, yes, many things are undoubtedly better, but I can't imagine the beginnings of my creative journey ending up the same. Eventually, people moved over to MySpace and I also had a DeviantArt, and it was still fun to create designs on them, but I wasn't active as much. And then I think in 2006, Facebook became the new thing, and I took a pause from designing completely. And this was mostly because I wanted to pursue a medical career in college. That obviously didn't work out and I ended up graduating with a business degree. And around this time is when Instagram was getting popular. So I first joined in 2011 and these are my first photos. Here's a scenic landscape at my university and the beautiful interior of a Panera Bread in Los Angeles. At the time, I remember thinking the platform was really fun. Obviously, it was more content focused, which removed a lot of the personalization that I liked from the others, but you had these cool filters and your friends could see your photos. And I was trying to be all artistic and it became my main platform. I started various creative projects on it. I had a huge hand lettering phase and started to make videos on that. Then I did a quote graphic a day project. And then a few years ago, I started a business called Hunter that I've talked about a few times on this channel. It was a handmade accessories by me and apparel company that primarily advertised and sold through Facebook and Instagram, but I've since closed it down in 2020. So personally, I have experience using it as a sole creator and as an e-commerce business. If I look at those photos I posted in 2011 and think, would I post them in 2024? I probably wouldn't, or at least not casually anymore. Because looking at it as a content creator, there's just a lot more to consider, which is funny because that's obviously a preference, but the environment's changed so significantly since then. In 2012, 2013, I was working at various entertainment social media agencies in Los Angeles. And at the time, social media wasn't seen as something so serious yet. It made sense for that industry, but it was just gaining steam. Obviously, that makes sense because when Instagram was acquired by Facebook, it didn't have a clear monetization strategy yet. So to traditional marketers, it was pretty ambiguous. And even as far as 2015, when I was working at a big entertainment company, we had a new property we were debuting. And I remember when looking over the marketing plan, it lacked a social strategy. I thought that was odd given the demographic it was targeting. So me and my coworkers made one along with the creative assets. In 2010, Instagram's revenue was effectively zero. By 2015, because of ads, it was half a billion. And in 2024, it's projected to be 59 billion. Due to these revenue numbers, high expectations from various shareholders, and pressure to innovate, Instagram is becoming a prime digital advertising and commerce-centric platform, and it's now integral to any business or marketing strategy. 
It's always been hard to balance marketing with the creative in any setting. And I feel like Instagram epitomizes this struggle. How do you promote the world's moments while also generating revenue? To me, the answer would be to grow slowly in balance, but then that makes them less competitive. So because they're a business, they lean into it. And it makes sense. I mean, look at Zynga. It's out of business probably for many different reasons, but I would argue a lack of monetization was probably the most significant. They did have an ad banner at the top, but you could remove it with code. So given Instagram's clear direction, this means the platform isn't as conducive to creatives or the process as it once was. It's unfortunate that a platform that originally emphasized community and creativity and has features to support these ideas kind of falls short in fulfilling its original intent. As I was writing this, I wasn't sure how I wanted to end it because considering everything we just discussed, it's easy to say the problem is just the company, but it's more nuanced than that. I do think it's disingenuous how they keep marketing themselves. Because they've been free to use monetarily since the beginning, they can get away with promoting an image and values associated with their original intent, even though their business model is completely different. The platform is now an ad and commerce driven hub and what they communicate isn't really reflective of what they are now. It's also not free to use anymore, you're paying with your data. But this isn't something everyone understands, both in terms of its implications and as a currency because it's not tangible. And this lack of understanding was definitely taken advantage of. So now we come to the real problem which falls on its users. And it's not realizing what Instagram has become all of this and still thinking it's just a casual platform to post on. Because they're a business and free to use, they don't owe anyone anything. We associate social media with being free, but there was a shift around the mid 2010s and it's not anymore. Again, it's a full fledged advertising and commerce platform where the business model revolves around you and your data. So if your perception of it is still a fun place to share photos and videos, it might be on the surface, but as a whole, it's not. You kind of have to look at it like a childhood friend. You got along really well in the beginning, but then both of you grew up and realized you don't have the same values anymore. Now you could grow together, but obviously Instagram's a business, so that's out of the picture. Or you could ignore your needs and just go along with what they want, but then that's toxic. So your choices are either go your separate ways or set some boundaries. And right now I set boundaries. So content creation wise, my main platform is YouTube. And then I would say Instagram and threads. I have a TikTok, but I just repost there. So I'm not really on the app and Twitter X. I used to be really active there, but it just became polarizing, so I stopped. And I did try Facebook again, but I just couldn't get into it. But it all depends on what your goals are. Despite being a creative myself, mine have always been to build a business or a brand. Creative and business have always gone hand in hand for me. So from that lens, it makes sense to have a presence on these platforms. And personally, there have been many positives. I've been inspired by artists, kept up to date with trends, and received numerous opportunities. But on the flip side, a lot of the content has been derivative and unoriginal. And the constant platform changes have been kind of tiring. If you are a creative or artist wanting to learn from others or receive critiques or just be in a community, Instagram doesn't really cultivate that environment. Because of the nature of the platform and doom scrolling, people just don't take the time anymore. So if you find you resonate with the sentiment, there's no problem in leaving it and social media behind. But if you want to post your stuff online and are conflicted, what do you do? The first is to figure out what your creative goals are and then find a platform that works for you. Obviously, there's pros and cons to every platform, but knowing what your creative goals are will help you decide where to go. I know there are a lot of artists leaving Instagram to go to Kara or Mastodon. And those are options, but personally, the reason I'm on the bigger platforms is to reach people outside the creative sphere. The business I want to build is going to target a more general audience. So if you are in this position, you need to decide what you want and where you might feel the most comfortable. And for me, that's YouTube. I feel like I can have more of a voice and be flexible in the way I communicate. The second is if you find Instagram is still your best option, know what you're getting yourself into. From my experience, I feel like Meta's platforms are a fine place to build a business. But as Kevin Ram, the creative, I'm definitely more cautious. 
Everything is about content creation, and I don't like seeing my actual art as content, but I also don't mind creating content around the process of creating art, if that makes sense. I see it as a fun challenge and just a new medium to work in, but I'm always careful about it influencing my actual art because I know how harmful it can be to the general creative process. So if I see it taking too much time and starting to affect me, I step away and take a break. I view it more as a living portfolio for opportunities with my primary presence on YouTube. The third is to stay true to your creative process wherever you go. When creating on any of the big social platforms, the key is to maintain a balance between the algorithm and your art, but always make sure it's something you want to make. This is for your own sanity, but also for whatever you're going to build. I've fallen into the trap of going viral for things I didn't really care about creating, which is another video I could make. In the short term, you grow really quickly, but in the long run, it's not fulfilling to you creatively and it doesn't really garner a quality audience. So always prioritize what you want to make and set those boundaries. Quality will always win and growing organically is key. I hope this video was helpful or insightful. Again, this video wasn't meant to capture everyone's experience with social media. It was just to highlight what can happen if you don't have that awareness and set boundaries. As a regular user, it's still entertaining and I'm sure lots of people have positive experiences on it. I wanted to make this because a couple of younger artists reached out to me feeling insecure about their art and posting on social media, specifically Instagram. And I just find that so sad. I hate that. When you're trying to establish your creative identity and learn what you like, it's crucial to have a supportive environment. And I'm not saying it should be Instagram, but because it's so accessible, it's generally where most people post. And if you're not aware of the business side of it and all the dangers around it, it can be damaging to your development. Just know that despite whatever social media tells you, you are a great creative and on your learning journey to becoming better. Anyway, let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.